Hey guys, and welcome back to another video. Today, we're looking at a properly vintage laptop. This is the venerable IBM PC Convertible 5140. It is the first laptop, quote unquote, laptop that IBM produced. It is not, however, the first portable. Um, this is the first true laptop form factor machine, though, however. It has a hinged design like you would see on most modern machines. However, it is incredibly chunky and very, very heavy. It also has a handle, which is possibly the greatest thing ever. Um, <clears throat> this is also one of very few laptops in the world that has a proper mechanical keyboard and has gained somewhat of a cult following because of it. Now, this uses the um, very rare Alps Brown switches, which I believe only two machines ever used, this being one of them. Uh, and the other, I'm, I actually don't know what the other one was now that I think of it. Um, but anyway, this machine was released in, I believe, 1986. So it is a proper 80s machine. It has a monochrome LCD screen, um, and it can be expanded up to 640K of RAM. This machine had no internal storage, such as hard drives or anything like that, so you relied entirely upon its dual 720K floppy drives. These are 3.5 inch drives, and they were the first that IBM actually used. So this is the first machine released by IBM to include a three and a half inch floppy drive. Now, one of those two drives would be used for booting and the other one would be for an application disk, presumably, or whatever combination. Um, technically, you could remove the operating system disk partway through and have a program disk and another storage disk. That can be done. Um, However, yeah, so we're a bit limited on functionality in that sense, um, and the screen was probably the biggest killing uh, factor of this unit. So it's quite an interesting display. It is monochrome. It is very widescreen. Um, that's not a good thing in this sense. It... Um, it's a proper 80 column display, but it's very poor in contrast. And while there was a version of this with a backlight available, this is not one of them. And the screen is very, very difficult to see. Also, some programs are not compatible with its weird orientation and uh, uh, weird height on it. Um, on the front here, we have a contrast adjustment slider. We have our dual three and a half inch 720K floppy drives, and we have our glorious mechanical Alps Brown keyboard, which is in absolutely pristine condition on this unit. I am very, very pleased with it. Um, this machine does work. However, we won't be turning it on today for the simple fact of it stinks when it runs. I do not know why, but this thing smells of... I, I don't know how to describe it. Kind of like a dead fish smell when it's running. It's very, very unpleasant, and overall I can't stand to have it running for more than a couple of minutes in my house, or it stinks everything up. So we will be avoiding that and just be doing a physical overview of the machine today. Now, something rather interesting with this design is the way that it expands when you uh, close the uh, lid or when you open it, per se. So you'll notice this area here is actually hinged and moves up. So watch the, uh, watch the action in this as we close the display. That is quite neat. So it forms a nice slab when it's closed, and then as you open it, it raises the whole profile of the machine slightly and angles the disk drives upwards to allow for easier insertion of the disks. Now the actual mechanism inside this is quite interesting. Um, it's kind of a cammed sort of mechanism. I've had this machine apart already because I was trying to figure out what the smell was coming from. Um, 
And uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool, and it's quite robustly built inside. In fact, the whole thing is very robustly built, especially this large metal handle on the front. I mean, just listen to that. You can't argue with a nice clunk. Now, this keyboard, it really is the selling point of this laptop for anybody looking to purchase one nowadays, and a lot of people sadly are buying these to harvest the keys because this is one of only two sources of these particular Alps Brown switches, which I have to say are my favorite switches I have ever used. Now, I would absolutely love to have more of these. In fact, I would like to retrofit something like a AT101 from Dell with... Um, with these brown switches. Now not every key uses an Alps brown switch on this keyboard. The uh, the little arrow keys over here, these are a linear type, like I think they're a small half height green Alps switch, but they are linear along with this. And any of the half height keys, like the function keys at the top, these are also linear switches. But the browns are a quite a glorious tactile switch. They have a very pronounced tactile bump and just a fantastic sound to them overall. They are very smooth and they have a very, very, very pronounced tactile bump and it's actually towards the top of the key press. It gives way and then there's very little resistance afterwards, so they tend to bottom out. Now, some people may not like that, but I find them extremely pleasant to use, and I would love to be able to use this thing on a regular basis. Unfortunately, the smell prevents me from doing that. I'm really kind of disappointed with that because aside from that, this machine's in perfect condition. Now, I have some suspicions as to what might be causing that. Um, from what I've heard, it can be an issue with capacitors leaking and slowly leaching out their electrolytes into the, uh, into the air, things like that. After it warms up, it seems to be the worst, so that would kind of back up that theory. Um, it could also be something with the battery. However, I've removed the battery and it still makes the smell, so I don't think so. However, that battery for it does need rebuilt. As is another reason why I'm not going to be running this quite yet, because I would like to run it and demonstrate it when it's in full working order. Now, electrically, it does all seem to be fine. I did have to repair the floppy drives as they had some blown capacitors on them, which was preventing one of them from working. Um, I just re I redid the capacitors on those, and now they work fine. Um, but yeah, aside from that, the machine has worked just fine out of the box. So <clears throat> let's go ahead and flip it around. We'll go ahead and close this here. We'll take a look at the back. We'll notice a few interesting things going on back here. Now, it has an early docking port, essentially, back here. And this uh, this back here is, it's uh, rather odd. It's got some little metal reinforcement hook type things. Now this had modules that could plug into it. So they were kind of like a backpack module. So this thing's already quite long and chunky. There's actually a printer that attaches to this. And I have one. Miraculously, I was able to find one that was in just as good a condition as this unit. And it does indeed work. I did have to repair it slightly because in transit, a little plastic piece broke inside, which prevented it from working. But um, again, that is something for a future video. We'll do an entire video just on that printer. But it's quite cool. It's actually a thermal printer. So it uses uh, basically like fax paper to produce a uh, document. Um, and it uses roll paper. So quite cool. Um, very, very interesting printer to use, although it's extremely difficult to get a proper 8.5 by 11 sheet. 8.5, no problem. 11, well, it just depends upon how much text you have because it stops printing and you might only end up with a little sliver. So weird in that sense, but definitely usable. I'm sure there's some way you can have it feed to the correct length and then you can tear it off. Um, or you could get perforated maybe uh, thermal paper. That might be a better option. Um, I don't know where I would source anything like that, so I've just been using rolls of fax paper in it, which seemed to work just fine. 
Um, where was I going with this tangent? Yeah. Anyway, that plugs into here. There's also other modules that plug into this. I believe there's one that gives you a VGA port. Um, and that can be extremely useful because that would allow me to plug in its external monitor and get proper color VGA graphics out of it. Now, under here is where the battery would go if the battery was installed. It is currently not, but if we push down this little tab, which uh, is easier said than done, uh, that's staying on there. Anyway, the battery would go in there. Take my word for it. I don't feel like breaking my thumbnails on it right now. <clears throat> Spinning around to this side, you notice the very uh, curious placement of the power button. That sucks. It's, it makes no sense to be there. There's the power jack. There's the power button. It's kind of reminiscent of the, like the IBM 5150 with the switch in the back for some reason. It's also orange. Looks nice. Very inconvenient place for it to be. Not a huge deal. <clears throat> so, spec-wise on this thing, we talked about it earlier that this could be upgraded to 640K of RAM. Now, this has 640K. That was a pain to find. But, once it's been upgraded, it's quite easy. You got these little card uh, modules that plug in, and they all go under the keyboard. Uh, quite quite simple to upgrade just finding them in the correct capacity for it was a little difficult um, processor wise we have a CMOS version of the 8088 so very similar to the original IBM PC power wise however being a CMOS version it allows the machine to suspend and you can basically shut it down anytime exactly where it was hibernate it whatever suspend it to RAM and then carry it to wherever you need to be and then hit the power button and it comes right back up. So it, you're very unlikely to lose any work or anything like that with it. And it makes it very nice and quick and portable system to use because you don't have to wait for it to boot up every time. You can just pause what you're doing, take it to wherever you need to do or wherever you need to be and start it right back up and away you go. Um, again, would have been a fantastic machine to use if it didn't stink like fish. Oh, I'm, I'm quite sad about that, really. And I really hope somebody out there in the, um, in the comment section could please, 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 please tell me what the heck is going on with that, because I would love to fix this. I'm sure it has something to do with a capacitor. That's really the only thing in this that has any sort of, like, liquids or anything that could produce a smell when it gets hot, unless it's the plastic itself giving off some sort of weird gas i don't know but it, it doesn't make any sense because it doesn't do it unless it's running like it smells fine now um yeah anyway anyway enough waffling about on that um yeah it's a really really cool machine and i want to use this more i really do um i want to add it to my my uh fleet of retro machines that i uh i use for actually getting some work done Similarly to the uh, 5160, which is my primary device for, well, writing video scripts. And, well, technically I don't script my videos, but I come up with a sort of uh, idea of what I want to talk about in them beforehand. I write it out, and then I wing it afterwards. So that's why, obviously, this isn't scripted. Because I'm rambling a bit, as usual. <clears throat> I apologize. So, anyway... Would be nice to use this someday for getting some work done, but until I can figure out the weird smell issue with it, I don't see that happening. Um, but yeah, stay tuned. I would like to show off the printer at some time, as well just as a uh, an overall idea of what the machine can do. Um, we won't be getting into that right now. Again, don't want to run it. it smells too bad. Um, yeah. Anyway, you guys kind of know, you know what MS-DOS looks like already, so we can leave it at that. It runs DOS. I can put DOS 6.2.2 on here. It boots it up fine. It works. It can run most DOS applications at the speed that an IBM 5160 or 5150 would run them. So quite slow, limited on RAM. That's about it. Um, but yeah, it was a rather neat machine from back in the day. 
And for 1986, I think this thing did an excellent job at being a portable machine. Now, I can see the issues people could have with it, um, mainly the no built-in storage where there were other portables that were cheaper and a similar sort of construction to it that had hard drives at the time, albeit very limited sizes. Now, today that's not as big of a deal, but back in the day that would have been a massive disappointment. Also, the screen on this really lets it down, and that was something even in 1986, the screen was pretty bad. And again, it was kind of behind its time in that sense when it came out. Now, there was one saving grace to this. Um, this is actually not just a laptop or luggable. This is also a desktop. I don't have the external monitor for it, but if I could find one, this thing could be converted completely to a desktop PC. Now, as we lift this up, you'll see a little bit of a textured thing here. Press that in and that pops out and grasp the sides of the display firmly, and you can yank its head off. There we go. It now kind of resembles like an Apple II or something, which I kind of like it like this. I would love to have the monitor that sits above it. it has a little curved metal stand and the monitor sits right here. That would be awesome. This would be such a cool little setup. Um, Sadly, those monitors are insanely expensive and insanely rare, so I don't like my chances of finding one, but I tell you, if I can find one at a reasonable price ever, I'm going to get it for it. So maybe one of these years at the uh, Dayton, Ohio Hamvention, I'll run across one, but I doubt it. And if, if you guys haven't ever heard of the uh, of Hamvention, it's a ham radio convention that they put on uh, once a year in Dayton. It's actually in Xenia, Ohio now. It used to be in Dayton. Um, but it's really, really cool. They have this huge electronics and radio gear flea market. And you very, very frequently find old vintage computers and things like that being sold there for usually pretty darn good prices. It just depends upon the seller. Again, it's a flea market, so you never know what you're going to find. But it's a really cool place, and I have never come back empty-handed from that. So um, last year I actually found a beautiful X99 motherboard for $35, and I was able to build my girlfriend this really, really nice PC with it. So that was awesome, and I'm hoping this year we can find some equally cool either retro stuff or something else we can look at on the channels. So that'll be in May, so stay tuned for that. I'm hoping to be able to do some actual videography stuff through the convention, get some uh, get some shots of exploring that, and be able to share that adventure with you guys. So stay tuned for that, and uh, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed the little look at this PC. I'm sorry we didn't really get to use it, but um, once I figure out the uh, issue with this and get her working again properly, and so it doesn't stink up my house horribly, um, we'll be able to look at this a little bit more in depth and we could even do a teardown or something of it if that's something you guys would like to see. So let me know what you think in the comments and uh, I do take all of that to heart. Uh, don't forget if you like the video give it a thumbs up and if you like the channel overall and want to see more stuff like this please do consider subscribing and I will see you guys in the next video.